Welcome to today's Software AG webcast titled, Government Success, How Delaware State Courts Unlocked Their Data. Today's program will be presented by Betsy Bakmurski, Application Support Project Leader, AOC, Judicial Information Center, Delaware Courts. Betsy is an Application Support Project Lead with the State of Delaware AOC, Judicial Information Center. Betsy is responsible for application development, enhancement, support, and modernization of the mainframe criminal court applications for CCP, Superior and Family Court, as well as for the mainframe civil applications for Family Court. Betsy has been an employee of the state of Delaware for 25 and a half years, and she has been working with Software AG for 25 of those years. As we move through today's program, we invite you to submit any questions that you may have via the question box, which is located under the video screen you are now viewing. In the event that we're not able to answer your question, your submission will be noted, and we will be back in touch with you as soon as possible. Today's program is being recorded. This recording will be made available to you in an email that will be sent to you within approximately 24 hours. It is now my pleasure to welcome Betsy Bakmurski. Good afternoon, everyone. Um, thank you for having me back. Some of you will hear a repeat presentation from uh, some of the other presentations I've done for Software AG and Web Methods. but. Um, do not try to adjust your television sets. You're about to enter the twilight zone because I am doing this off the cuff. So <clears throat> a little bit of history about Delaware. For those of you who aren't from Delaware, some of you I know are, and some of you probably already know this information. But we are considered the first state because we were the first to ratify the Declaration for the United States and then the Constitution for the United States in 1787. We we're called the Diamond State because of our location on the east Eastern seaboard, where we open to the ocean, the Atlantic Ocean, but the Delaware River runs right up the coastline of Delaware, which is a safe haven for both um, protection from the invasion of the British, as well as transportation of arms and troops and food and uh, everything like that. We like to say, I live in Claymont, so I'm about mm, three quarters of a mile from the river. We like to say we live in Claymont by the sea, which is really not the truth. It's the river, but it's very pretty in the morning still. Uh, Delaware has very gracious corporate tax laws. So we have over 1.3 million legal entities here in Delaware, uh, which keeps our civil courts in business, um, which is funny because we have more legal entities in Delaware than we have people in Delaware, as you can see by the population there at the bottom of the screen. Another fun facts about Delaware, we are only approximately 100 miles long, which makes our court systems uh, so congealed because we only have three counties. We use two agencies to, to uh, maintain these court systems. Um, we're only about nine miles wide at the narrowest point and 35 miles wide at the, at the largest point. Our, our state is completely flat except for, those of you who know this, Iron Hill, which is a bump just outside of Newark, uh, where there is a nice little Iron Hill Museum that shows some native Indian artifacts and it's a one room schoolhouse actually. It's actually hysterical, but you should go and see it if you ever come to Delaware, it's, it's, it's worth to see. Um, we have the lowest elevation at 450 feet. Uh, we do not have a cave here in Delaware, although the room I'm working out of right now could probably be declared a cave if anyone ever actually saw it. Uh, the Delaware Bay is the largest population of horseshoe crabs, which are big, ugly, terrible looking things that you'll see all along the shore almost prehistoric creatures, obviously, um, but very interesting for the little kids. And we are the largest scrapple producer, although I have heard that Pennsylvania and New York challenge that. And one of the creative things that Delaware has done, the Dogfish Head Brewery down uh, state created a scrapple beer, which they said sold out immediately. So we are scrapple lovers here in Delaware. So enough of that stuff. So who are we, who do we serve? Uh, and what is the point of this? So as JIC, we're the Judicial Information Center, we support the courts. Uh, we support Supreme Court in a moderate fashion, Superior Court criminal, Court of Common Pleas criminal, Family Court civil and criminal, and aspects of Justice of the Peace. Dell just does a lot of the Justice of the Peace um, applications. Now, when I say that these are the people we support for criminal, I'm talking about me, a mainframe programmer. We also have a civil off the shelf product that uh, JIC supports, but that's not in my wheelhouse anymore. So um, 
we will just focus on the things that I do with the mainframe. We do have specialty courts with the veterans court, the drug court. I think the veterans court just was a big announcement from the White House about this. Delaware did this several years ago. Um, we, we interact with the Department of Corrections, Department of Justice, Human Services, and through Delgis, the Delaware State Police. So we're pretty active in these courts. Uh, my slides are freezing. Hmm. Oops, oops, going back. Here we go. So what do we do? So when I came in the early 80s, uh, we had an application written for the courts. It was written in COBOL. I'm not exactly sure what the database was. And as a newbie, I came in and was a COBOL programmer, and they threw at me that we were going to change this. We were going to go to database and natural. And I thought, oh, man, here we go. I come in here, I think I know what I'm doing, and they're going to slam me with this. So sent us down to Resden, Virginia to teach us natural, and I fell in love. Fell in love with the program, fell in love with the database, fell in love with all of it. I thought, this is the most fun thing I've ever seen. And so we started converting our CMS and CGIS systems. So in 1995, approximately around that time, um, Superior Court wanted to have a more shiny, gooey front end on their system. So we created broker calls and decided that the best way, now this wasn't my decision, I came in on this, this was already underway, decided that the best way to do this was to use these large control blocks of data. So every transaction that was sent from the GUI front end would have a transaction type. That transaction type would be sent to a parser. That parser would say, oh, this transaction type needs to parse out the data that's coming to me in this method. And that was fine, I guess, at that time, because that was the way we could do it, I guess, and congeal it. The problem with that was that when you needed to update this or change or add a field or data every one of those programs would have to change because the parser would have to change and the, the, the data size would have to change. And it, it, was, it started to become uh, a mess. So we wanted to convert to this nice, shiny point and click front end. We wanted to convert this. So, so what happened was the servers were being deprecated. DB5 was totally deprecated. We had to get on new servers. We had to get our VB5 uh, front end upgraded to uh, .NET. So along came, along came web methods. And another, uh, another uh, application was CRISP, where, where we would display these <clears throat> court schedules in, inside the lobbies of the courthouse. So as the clients would come in, they could look up on these nice rolling calendars and say, okay, that's my schedule. That's my courtroom. I know where I'm going. We also had handheld devices at one time. I'm not sure we still have all those things, but this was also done with the exact same control block data. <clears throat> so we had to upgrade this as well. It had to come off the servers. <clears throat> Please excuse me. <clears throat> it had to come off the servers and it had to be upgraded to .NET. So um, another process was they wanted to, to create this single view where all courts could see all data, all court staff could see all data. And how do we do that? We couldn't do that with those big, large control blocks. So what we did was we were introduced to web methods. And that absolutely opened my eyes to everything. So what we did was we took those programs that were all intertwined with parsers and control block data and you can't touch this and you can't fix that. You can't, you'll break it, don't touch it. I said, we can strip this out. We'll strip out the control block data. We'll strip out the parser. We leave the guts of the program where all the work is done. All the calculations and verifications and all, we don't have to touch that. We don't have to rewrite that. All we really need to know is what parameters need to come into this program and what parameters need to go out of this program. And we created subprograms. So we copied the old programs. Nobody touches them. They keep running while we're over here 
taking, stripping these out. So, okay, this program only needs four input parameters. Great. We're only sending out 15 output parameters. Great. What are they? Name them the same as the program sees them and create a web service out of it through web methods. Supply a URL to the .NET applicator, application developers and they can consume it one at a time. This individualized every one of these applications, uh, programs in the application. Now we could touch any one of them. We could add a parameter, we could pass a new parameter, we could pass out a new parameter, we could add fields to the screens without disrupting <clears throat> the entire shebang. So, and it's fun. It's actually really very fun and you can convert them very quickly. So the nice thing about that was while we're developing this, and <clears throat> using the programs, the guts of the programs that are running in production, uh, we never have to touch production. As it got developed and as we started testing it, we can run them. We could run them simultaneously, <clears throat> two separate programs, or two ones. One's using a server, the other's using a broker. <clears throat> we can run them side by side, and that opened up that opened up a world of things. Then then the users are coming to us. Oh, well, can we add this here? Could we have that there? Could we have this drop down? The other thing was we didn't have to have these SQL databases sitting out there on a server somewhere and reload them <clears throat> every time there was an update to a table. Now we use real time table drop downs. The tables are loaded to a temporary SQL server for, for standard stagnant tables just once in the morning. Every morning, the first time the application gets fired up, the new tables for that day um, get loaded so that we don't have lag time with, you know, constantly making these calls, these big tables. And it, it worked, it worked seamlessly. It was wonderful. So, um, as we were doing that, we came up with this single view process where we could just start writing sub program, sub program after sub program after sub program. What data do you need? Where do you want it? We would write a sub program. You tell me what you're sending me. I'll tell you, you know, you tell me what you need. Send me the stuff. I'll send it back to you. Create an IDL, whip it into a web service. Go ahead, consume it, and and off we went. So that project unfortunately got tabled due to budget constraints and things like that. But it it really was a a, a good way to learn, uh, as well as uh, it just showed the the power that the mainframe web methods and any entity that wanted to consume these things could do and how quickly it could be done. And then comes along uh, the need that, so we have a judge attorney table in our systems, of course, we're the courts. Along comes the need that the uh, judge attorneys were now going to outsource the DOE legal, to a DOE legal, the database of who's a judge, who's a lawyer, when were you, Accept it into the bar, you know, all your stagnant data, all that special stuff that everybody needs to know about a judge and an attorney and all that stuff. Well, we still need to know it. Even though it's now on the DOE legal database, we still need to know it. We needed to know it in our civil system, which was context. We needed to know it in our CMS system, which is JIC. And we also needed to know it in our CGIS system. So with web methods and the flow services, with context and a JDBC adapter, we were able to create a service right within the web methods um, process screen. I'm trying to, let me pull this up real quick. Right within the service developer, we were able to create flow services, identify the data elements, also verify data elements. We could stop the service at that point if data was entered incorrectly, we could, um, concatenate data if it needed to be concatenated, uh, verify the user coming in, all of that could be done right within the service developer of web methods. And so we did that. Now, that would take, with the JDBC adapter, take it and update our context civil system. One call from DOE Legal calls this service, boom, updates context. Well, at the end of that flow service, it then goes out and consumes the service that we created on the mainframe with a subprogram that then updated both CMS and CGIS because CMS and CGIS are um, integrated through the mainframe. Our, our CICS uh, areas talk to each other. Our, our libraries are step lived. We can access data, update data within each other's systems. <clears throat> so the call comes in, updates one database. If it fails there, it gets kicked out. 
You never get bad data going into the mainframe. Once it passes the context flow, it consumes the web service created on the mainframe from the mainframe, I should say. It consumes that, and boom, updates the next two, done. Every morning that happens at 10.30. So there is sort of a drop file, something the DOE legal worked out over there. Um, we, don't have, we don't have like an integration with their system in real time. So, but they, they consume the service and all we do is execute it. So that's, so that's, that's how DOE legal came about. And that was our first forward facing outside agency consumption of a web service to the mainframe. And that just opened up everybody's eyes to the fact that, you know, we're not stuck anymore. We're not stuck in this black hole where our mainframe data can't be manipulated in other methods and clicking, but we're not moving. Okay. So the next thing that came along for outside facing agencies, and this is an actual picture of our web page that is public facing, was the IBR e-payment system. So the CCP went out and hired a vendor um, to do this IBR system where, you know, they're going to have people call in, get this voice process system, and they can get their schedule, and they can get their payment amounts, and they can get all this stuff, and it's going to be wonderful. And, and at the 11th hour, they come back and say, well, wait a minute, how do we get this data out of the mainframe? And, you know, to my shock and surprise, they came to me and I thought, we'll just write a web service. They can consume this web service. We'll send, you know, you send me what you need to send me, either a case number or a date of birth. I will send you back the case and its information, its schedule information, its payment information. Or if you send me a date of birth, I will send you back an array of names. IBR does the process of eliminating the names as uh, you go through it because you, as the user will actually say their name after, after the database creates this array and IVR will actually start to fish down that name and find the cases that actually match the name and the date of birth. And then you get your scheduled information. If you don't have scheduled information, you get your payment information. Um, you're on a uh, time to pay. It'll tell you what your amount due is, what your balance is, what your amount due is. It'll tell you when you need to be in court. And, and all that, all from the mainframe, comes right out of the mainframe, right off our scheduling file, our event schedule file, right out of CGIS's, um financial files. And, um, and then their option is to make a payment. And if they want to make a payment, now I am not in charge of this service that, that gets consumed by IBR, but Dell just has, has a payment uh, service that then goes, IBR goes back and calls the Delgis system service and the payments actually get pasted. Um, it's not actually real time because they have to make sure that everything clears, but it gets posted into the system. So that's our second uh, forward facing. And the nice thing about this is I was in the middle of a huge uh, conversion of financials for Superior Court when they came to me and said, uh, this thing has to go live in a month. And how do we get the data? Well, being a legacy programmer, I know where the data is. And now with web methods, I know I can just get it easily, simply turn it into a web service and have them consume it in an instant. And inside that uh, subprogram on, on the mainframe, we can attach any fees that might be there. So if they owe $200 and there's a $5 fee for paying it online, you can come back and say, you know, you owe $205 and it all just goes back to them. And it's a one program. It's one little subprogram. had it done in less than a week couple of little tweaks to it and it was it was ready to go before the deadline. It's really it was really fun. If I can say that now. It wasn't fun then, but it was fun now. So this is a little bit of the uh, I don't know if you can see this is really tiny on my screen. I have a tiny screen. Uh, a little bit of the flow of how IVR works. So the call comes in, uh, goes into an IVR server within our um, you know XML firewalls. Our services all have ACF2 user IDs and passwords, so we know whether or not this is legal or not, if they're picking up the right thing, what port they're coming in on, and, uh, and then it'll pass it on through, bring back the data. If you're searching by date of birth and you, you pick the right, you know, you get your name and everything, it'll start to list for you 
all your char all your case numbers. So if you have four or five case numbers, you say the program will come back and say is case number one two three four five six seven eight nine the one you're looking for. You say no. One two three four five six seven zero no, and then so on and so on until you pick the right case, the case you're looking for, <clears throat> and uh, and then it goes and gets that information for you from the financial system and from the event schedule system. Um, so that was a fun thing to do. And they are two forward facing, uh, web services to the public at this point. We have another one waiting, which is for, uh, the standard sentence order project that we are underway for using mainframe sentencing. However, we're going to be sending the printed version of the mainframe sentence order to a planet press printer who will scrape the data, PDF the data and email it out. They will then consume a small web service that will tell us if it's successful, who it went to, date and time it went there, and what program did the update. If it's unsuccessful, it'll send us back that it was unsuccessful to our error log on the mainframe and the reason why. So we're waiting. That hasn't gone live yet because COVID hit. We were just about ready to really push that forward with the course, but COVID hit and, um, and it's sort of just sitting there. Uh, but we're excited to get that going. And uh, that too is just a simple, tiny web service. When I, when, when, when I, when the mainframe writes the, 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 the order out to the Planet Press printer, we update the error log on the mainframe to say success or fail for ourselves. And then once Planet Press processes that sentence order and sends it to, to a DOC email and also to a court email, so they don't have this paper printing out constantly, constantly, constantly. They all come out in the same format. Everybody knows where the sentence information is, where you know conditions information is. Everything is going to come out in the same place. As soon as they're successful, they just consume this one little web service, come back, tell us it was successful, where it went, what time it went. And uh, the courts can go through and check that on their log. We have on the mainframe, we have uh, maintenance programs and go through, check the log. But they'll also be getting an email saying that the sentence went through. And that was also very quick. Uh, the process uh, creating the standard sentence order wasn't so quick because it, standard is only, you know, I'm doing this with air quotes, you can't see me, but standard in our world is, uh, yeah, the data is in the same place. Everybody's data is different because the courts all have their own special needs, but that's okay. I mean, that's what we're here for. That's, that's how I keep my job. So that was IBR um, and our standard sentence order that's coming up. Hopefully that, that, and that's what I was talking about here. Hopefully that's going to be uh, going live when this COVID is, is over, or even if it's not over, if we find better ways to communicate with each other and test and our problem right now is printing uh, when everyone's working from home, nobody has a network printer. So uh, that's, that, that's our biggest holdup right now. So I just talked about all this, um, I should have switched screens. I apologize. Like I said, I'm, you're sort of in the twilight zone. I'm talking off the cuff here. But uh, so looking forward, that's going to be our next project. But the other thing I really wanted to, to stress that, that I haven't stressed in other presentations is the fact, and I talked about, I touched on it a little bit earlier, is the fact that we can convert existing applications into web services without ripping the guts out of our programs, without rewriting programs, without reinventing the wheel. We just simply strip the way we receive and pass data. Any program, any program can be turned into a web service in a matter of minutes. It can be tested on the mainframe. You can test it on the mainframe just like you test any other sub program. You can be tested within the within the um, the process developer, the service developer inside the web methods application. You can put data in there, test it, make sure it works before anyone ever consumes it. Um, and and it's quick, it's easy, it's fun, and you can create new little sub programs. These quick queries that people need. You know how they're always. I, I'm talking to you, state people. You know, they're always coming at us for these little ad hocs. We need this, we need that, but we only need it today. Uh, you can, you know, you can write these things so quickly, just got to find a way to present it to them. So instead of this rip and replace that we're talking about, and if that's what's going to happen, that's what's going to happen. I'm, you know, I'm in it for the long haul. But instead of rip and replace, these, these bright, shiny front ends can be put on there with legacy applications in the background. 
which can now be enhanced, changed, increased, decreased, you know, made into smaller, little tiny smaller pieces. If we want to make them smaller pieces, you can do agile programming now because once you once we stripped out the control block, any program can be worked on now at any point in time. Uh, changed, enhanced, re just you know, republished out there. Uh, it's it, it it is just. I, I wish I had uh, an interactive screen of how quickly you can create these web services. Like I watched people doing their APIs in the old way and how much code it takes and how much work it is and how precise it has to be. But with this, our input and output data parameters are actually dynamic. You don't even have to worry about the size of them. Um, like I said, you can build arrays, you can pass large amounts of data. And from the, from the mainframe program, you go into the process developer, you click on it, you say, I want to create a new IDL from natural. You, you, you tell which program you want to create the IDL from. Boom, the IDL is created. Then you go over to the service developer and you say you want to create a web service. Well, first you have to create an adapter, uh, which that's where all your ACF2 um, protection is because your connection strings t tells it whether or not it, this, this service is legal or not. So you create an adapter, it's connected to a secure connection string that you create. You can create one connection string for the whole application, or you can create a connection string for each individual application. We chose to go with each individual application the second time around. With single view, we had one connection string. But unfortunately, when that happens, when we bring it down, it brings everything down. Or if there's something wrong with that connection string, nothing's going to work. So we, we decided to go with um, individual connection strings. Even though the data is pretty much the same, the user ID and the password is pretty much the same, it is, it is dedicated to that particular WSDL that's going to be executed. So as long as that particular connection string is up and running, that WSDL is going to work and be able to be consumed. Um, and it, eh, it makes for a big long column on your left hand side of your developer, but it's it's much easier that way to do it, in my estimation. Okay, so I'm not a pro. I'm just saying, um, and it's it's just been it's been great fun. And and even as ASAP went live, as things needed to be changed, I can go in and change one sub program. If there's nothing changed in the data parameter areas, all I have to do is recompile and um, move that program to production. The WSDL stays there, the WSDL still runs, the program still processes. Now, you know, if we add data, if we, had a, if, if we need to put a new output element out there, of course, then .NET needs to change because we're gonna add it to a screen or, uh, and the WSDL will change, the IDL will change, but that's all very quick. It's very quick, it's very easy. So um, I am not the guru of web methods. I'm not the guru of anything, um, but any technical questions that I can't answer or we don't have time for at this point, uh, I'm sure the SAG, that's the other great thing, the SAG people were there for us all through this learning curve, and we still have a big learning curve to go through, but the, the, you know, it's like we've been inside this box. Uh, the mainframe is just a lockdown, and somebody took a box cutter and slid a nice big open, and the sun's coming in, and now we're looking at other products that, that SAG has got out there. And those of you from the state, you know what I'm talking about. Um, connections that we're going to be able to have, data we're going to be able to share. Uh, you know, it just, it, it just I, I'm so excited about the future of what we can do with the mainframe and the data and the legacy applications. You know, like I said, young people can learn natural. Natural is an easy language to learn, and it's a fun language to learn. They are already going to come knowing .NET and SQL and everything else. They're all going to know that. And they can use all those skills, but they can also use the natural in the background, and these legacy systems don't really have to be ripped and replaced. Uh, it's like throwing the baby out with the bathwater. I mean, it's absolutely uh, viable information. It's viable product. It's a, it's a, it's consistent. It's, it's fast. It's, uh, it's reliable. We have great support. All we have to do is make it prettier. And, and now with these new um, 
products that Software AG is coming out with, uh, we can make it pretty really fast. And uh, I think we can have a good time doing it. So that's about all I have to say. Um, sorry for my little disjointed thing, but like I said, I didn't write this down. I'm just talking to you as, a, as an old legacy programmer who uh, loves the mainframe and, and our natural applications and, and the years and years of customization that have gone into our products. I just hate to see all that go by the wayside and spend years and millions trying to replace what can just be reintroduced and re-exposed in all new ways, uh, quick, easy, and I don't know. I don't know finances, but it looks like it could be cheaper, but you'd have to talk to the finance people. Anyhow, um, so yeah, that's about all I have, Will. So uh, yeah, I'll leave it at that. Okay, I have a couple of questions that I do want to pose to you. Okay. Um, the first one, how many agencies do you integrate with and what were some of the challenges you faced prior to integrating with them? Well, that all depends on the uh, type of integration you're talking about. So we in, we're integrated with Siegis, uh, the Delgis system and, and everything through the mainframe. I mean, just like I had said earlier, I mean, we're, our CICS regents talk to each other. Or, our libraries are step live. We can do all that. Um, so the offshoot agencies, you know, I don't know. I guess there's 15 or 16 different agencies. But right now we're not, we're not, uh, we're still doing the old drop the file and, you know, pick up in a batch job and, and uh, doing that sort of integration with them, which uh, I'd really like to get away from. I, I, there's just absolutely no reason we should have to do this anymore. We, we have all kinds of connectors in web methods. We have ODBC, JDBC. We have the entire X connections. We have all these connectors. I, I, I would like to turn most of that stuff into a service. Um, but then we do our outside agencies are like what I told you before, the DOE legal system, the IVR system, um, and uh, our internal .NET applications we uh, now do for Chris and ASOP and uh, we would really like to ro roll uh, court docs and everything into Chris, but we haven't gotten there yet. Uh, our challenges are, you know, for those other integrations are they just the same old, same old challenges, you know, the file didn't drop or something happened and, you know, the file didn't get picked up or, uh, you know, those things are our challenges for, for the applications. Our biggest challenge was the, the net parm in natural, so CGIS and JIC or Delgis and JIC, we have different natural environments and Delgis was already up and running with their extended NAT parms and JIC wasn't. So when we started testing ASAP, it was, you know, one in, one out service, one in, one out. Well, nobody knew that until like a bunch of people started testing. Somebody did a name search. Everybody sat still for five minutes and we realized we had to increase our NAT parm. But Software AG came in, Bob Jeffcott and... Becky and uh, Eric, they all they all came in and 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 fixed that for us almost immediately. Once that was done, so that was our honestly that was our biggest challenge. Uh, the DOE legal uh, challenge was actually learning the flow service, but you know that's that's just a learning curve. How many web services have the Delaware courts created, and how do you maintain them? So that's just a funny thing. So uh, we have over one hundred and fifty something web services. If you count what we did for. For the single view, we probably have over 250 web services. But right now, uh, the web services we use for ASOP, we have uh, just about 144. Uh, anytime something new comes, you know, we turn that into a web service. So that that increases if they if we're going to enhance that product. Uh, we have the two forward-facing web services. These are very simple, but give a lot of data to the public. A lot of data to the public. Very simple web so sub programs turn into web services. Um, and to maintain them, it's just like maintaining any natural subprogram. So because we did create our connection strings separately for each of our adapters, uh, each one of those is completely independent and can be agile work done and any enhancements or, or uh, bug fix or anything like that can be done without bringing down the whole system. And, that, and that's how we maintain them. And they don't even have to be reposted if, if like I said, that the data um, are republished, I should say, if the data in the subprogram doesn't doesn't change. If the data in the subprogram stays the same and all we did was change manipulation of data or you know 
calculations or whatever, um, concatenations, whatever that, whatever went on in the subprogram, as long as the input and outputs don't change, the web services, the whistles never have to be changed. Okay. Uh, we are uh, past our scheduled program time, so I want to say uh, on behalf of Software AG, a warm thank you to everybody that has taken time from their afternoon to join us uh, for this program. Uh, again, on behalf of Software AG, Betsy, thank you for taking time from your schedule uh, to introduce us and invite us further into the Delaware courts to see how this has been progressing. So uh, thanks to everybody. Our program has now ended. Do enjoy the rest of your day.